big questions is to understand how and why some space-time picture and some gravitational dynamics emerges from uh, an ordinary non-gravitational quantum mechanical system, okay, a, f a field theory, or in the specific case that I'll mostly consider, the uh, conformal field theory. And um, so I mentioned that in some recent work in the past mostly uh, five years or a little more, um, something fascinating has started to emerge, and that is that <coughs> um, understanding entanglement and the structure of entanglement and physics of entanglement in this dual field theory seems like it may be a crucial piece of the story um, in order to understand how space-time and gravity emerges. And so in today's lecture, uh, I will start by reviewing many things about entanglement in quantum systems, and then we'll get to the special case of entanglement in field theories, and finally um, talk about entanglement in the context of holographic field theories. So I'm going to start um, with the, the basics. Uh, I want to consider a quantum mechanical system. So any quantum mechanical system um, that it has at least two subsystems. Okay, so so for example, you might have a set of spins, anything with m multiple degrees of freedom, um, and we could choose some subset of these degrees of freedom, and I'll call this subsystem A. And, and then we could call the complement B or A bar. I'll probably use both of those. Okay. And um, so in terms of the Hilbert space structure, Well, we have a, t a tensor product where the Hilbert space for the full system can be written as a tensor product of the Hilbert space for our subsystem and the Hilbert space for the complement. Okay. So to be um, concrete, sometimes uh, I'll work with a basis of states for these Hilbert spaces. So let's call this basis N. And I'll call this basis N. And then we can write a general state of the system as a quantum superposition of the basis elements in this tensor product basis. Okay. Okay. And this is, uh, so, so here I'm talking about a pure state or the standard states, the vectors in the Hilbert space. Okay. So suppose we have such a, a system in some state. Okay. Then um, we can ask the question, what is the what is the state of this subsystem? Maybe we're only interested in a particular part of the system. So I could I could ask the question: What is the state of subsystem A? Okay. So it turns out that in quantum mechanics. Um, <coughs> We can't associate uh, a pure state like this to the subsystem A. If, if the whole system is in, in this state, um, we can't write, so generally, we, we can't write this as, as some product of, of a state for the subsystem A and a state for the rest of the system.
Okay? We can see that just by some counting. For example, the number of, of numbers here necessary to specify this state is, is uh, the dimension of this one times the dimension of this one. The number of numbers here is just the sum of those dimensions. Okay, so generally speaking, uh, there's a lot more information here. And this is just a very special um, class of states. Okay. And so what we, what we say is that if, if for all of the states where you can't decompose like this, um, we would say that the system A is entangled with the rest of the system. Okay. So if not, we say A is rest. Okay. Uh, another way to say this is that, um, so if I, if I consider all possible states of this form, um, you know, we might just demand, we, we, maybe this is too strong, maybe we could fi still find a state of this form such that any measurements performed on that state would uh, give the same answer as measuring the subsystem in this state. Okay. Uh, but that's also not possible. Okay. So no, no pure state CNN gives the same results. as psi um, for measurements on A. Okay. But there is a way to, there, there is a way to uh, describe what is the state of the subsystem A. <clears throat> and that turns out to be um, the notion of an ensemble. So generally, Um, even if we can't find such a decomposition, the measurements on A are going to be reproduced um, by some ensemble of orthogonal states. And so that would be, for example, specifying some classical probabilities, P1, uh, so say with probability P1, we have a state CN1N, and with probability P2, we have another state and down to k n, where so here we generally have, this is the dimension of our Hilbert space. Okay, so this would be, so if I considered this ensemble of states, okay, there's always, there's always such a choice, um, then a measurement performed in this ensemble would reproduce a measurement performed in this state if we're just measuring the, um, the A subsystem. Okay. okay, so sometimes this is called a mixed state. Okay, um, if if more than one of the probabilities is non-zero. Okay, so let me, um, I'll, I'll Prove this to you. There's a, so there's another. There's another name for such a thing. Um, we also talk about a density matrix or a density operator. Okay, so how is that related? Okay, so the proof of this statement starts by considering our original state and then we consider some operator that we're interested in. Any operator, 
And we're, we're going to compute the expectation value of that in our original state, okay. uh, which I've erased. So let me write this state again. Okay. So, so if we plug in our definition of the state into here, what happens is that uh, the operator only acts on the first part. And so we can simplify the expression and it, after a line of algebra, you can get the following. Okay. Okay. So the um, we get some we get some Kronecker delta function from n and the corresponding thing over here that reduces here, and now we can finally write this as the trace of our operator that we're interested in <coughs> times some other operator that acts also just on the Hilbert space A. Okay. And, we're, and here rho, you can check, is defined to be this sum. Okay, so you can just plug all of this in and check it yourself. Um, that can be part of you. Pardon? Oh, in the first, okay, in the first line, yes, of course, in the first line I'm using the summation convention, and, and here I'm not. But. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, okay, so, so another way, oft, often people will just say trace over the, uh, the uh, A bar or the B subsystem of psi, psi, um, but I think if you haven't seen this before, it can be uh, mysterious. So this, so this object here, okay, in Dirac notation, it's, it's clearly an operator that's acting on the A subsystem. And this is what we would call um, the reduced density matrix, or sometimes just the density matrix, or sometimes the density operator um, for the subsystem A. Okay. So, um, so let's connect that to this uh, ensemble description. Okay, so, um, so let me write down some properties of rho. And all of these things are, again, things that are, are very easy to check and then you, you should do it for yourself um, for homework. So rho is Hermitian. <coughs> um, Rho has non-negative eigenvalues. Such that the sum um, pi, such that the sum of pi is equal to 1. Okay. And then using the eigenvectors corresponding to the, uh, these eigenvalues, we could write rho as Okay, so these psi i's are the corresponding eigenvectors um, for orthogonal psi i. Okay, and so then in this description we can rewrite um, the answer there. So trace rho <coughs> of OA is then just the sum over pi of these expectation values. I, okay, and so this is exactly what I claimed over here that I could find um, a set of orth orthogonal states psi i um, such that the results of, of um, this, well, so it's the expectation value um, in the ensemble, which I get by just summing using the classical probabilities, I'm averaging the results of the expectation value for my states in the ensemble. Okay. Any questions so far? So this is very basic, and then we'll now move on. Okay. So back. So going back, uh, just to remind you, um, the property of being entangled was the property that I couldn't write um, that I had to use an ensemble here rather than just a single state. And so this is related to the property that uh, these eigenvalues. Um, 
ha there's more than one non-zero eigenvalue. Okay. So this notion of an ensemble is familiar from It's familiar from quantum statistical mechanics. OK, or the idea of a density matrix. So just to remind you, uh, when we talk about the microcanonical ensemble, Um, this would be an ensemble with equal probabilities of all the states in some narrow range of energies, or the density matrix equal to this for E in this interval. Okay. Um, or in the canonical ensemble, So, f or finite or specific temperature states, we would say that we have state EI, so the energy eigenstate EI, and the associated probability is e to the minus beta EI over Z. Okay. Or Z equals. Um, So in the thermodynamics context, we don't always think of these density matrices or, as, or these ensembles as uh, arising from calculating a reduced density matrix from some pure state. We often just talk about the ensembles. Although in the case of the canonical ensemble, uh, the picture is really that you consider some heat bath, and then your system A and we consider very weak interactions between your system and the heat bath. And uh, so in that case, we could actually imagine that the full system um, is in some pure state psi and that we are actually calculating the reduced density matrix for this, uh, for this system that we're interested in. And the claim is that we would, we would, get, um, we would get this canonical ensemble. So this is, uh, as, as an interesting aside, this, this, um, <clears throat> um, th there's an interesting point that we could, we could get the same density matrix um, from many different pure states. We don't really care about the details of the heat bath. We expect to get the same result um, um, basically from any, from any heat bath that we define. Um, so, so a given row will have many I'll call them uh, purifications. So that'll be a, an important thing to remember for later. Okay, so I mentioned these, um, I mentioned these statistical mechanics examples. Uh, because they're useful for the next thing that I would like to do, which is to understand how we can quantify the notion of entanglement. Okay, so if I have an entangled state, so I could take A to be 1, or I could take A to be 10 to the minus 40, and in the second case we would say it's probably less entangled than the first case. Um, so it's useful to have some notion of how we can, how we can actually quantify entanglement in general. Okay. So again, we recall that entanglement implies that the set of these eigenvalues of the density matrix, uh, which, so this is just for some notation, this is sometimes called the entanglement spectrum.
Okay. Um, so entanglement means that this is not equal to 1, 0, 0, 0. And another way to say that would be that there exists some classical uncertainty about which state our subsystem is in. So the same kind of uncertainty that we talk about in statistical mechanics when we talk about the microcanonical ensemble or the canonical ensemble. And in that case, it's natural to quantify this uncertainty by the notion of entropy. Okay, so in the, in the um, microcanonical case where you have pi equals 1 over n, so equal probability for n different states, then what we do is define the entropy to be, we define the entropy to be this. Um, this logarithm is there to get a quantity that's extensive. So if I have, if I have two uh, different subsystems um, um, that have nothing to do with each other, then the, the entropy um, would just be the sum of the entropy for the first subsystem plus the entropy for the second subsystem. Okay. Um, so that's the origin of the log. Um, so another way to under so th this corresponds to the density matrix one over n, one over n. And so another way to um, understand this formula is to say that we can split it up, say that it's Say that we have a contribution of um, this probability times the log of the probability minus pi log pi um, for each eigenvalue in the matrix, for each eigenvalue of the density matrix. Okay, so minus pi log pi from each. I in value. And this suggests um, a natural way to, um, okay, to, to define an entropy in general. We could use the same definition. <coughs> okay, so for any density matrix, We could make this definition, okay, or in terms of the matrix trace row log row. And this is what's known as the von Neumann entropy. Okay, so you can check um, as homework that if you, uh, if you take the density matrix for the canonical ensemble, that this also gives the usual result for thermodynamic entropy. Okay. Actually, incidentally, um, okay, so here, here's a, uh, incidentally, uh, a, fu a fun thing to try is to start with this definition of entropy and Try to figure out the, the density matrix that has the maximum entropy for a fixed energy expectation value. And for trace of rho equals one, which is true of all density matrices. Okay. So um, so the, I'll tell you the answer, um, but you should try to show this. Um, this is another, this is the answer is the canonical density matrix. Okay, so the thermal density matrix is the density matrix that maximizes this von Neumann entropy for a given energy expectation value. Okay, so you could try to show that and then also try to check that if you calculate the value of this von Neumann entropy for that thermal state, then you end up with um, what, would, what you would usually calculate as the entropy for, um, 
for a state at a given temperature. Question, yeah. Uh, so we can consider as axiom or uh, Gibbs uh, <coughs> uh, or the fact that entropy is maximum, uh, either the fact that uh, the partition function has the form as Gibbs set, uh, but uh, can we uh, just introduce the fact that uh, entropy is maximum or the uh, standard form of partition function just from the basic laws of quantum mechanics, not uh, introducing either of them like the next one. Can we uh, get the fact that, uh, partition, that entropy is maximum just from the basic laws of quantum mechanics, uh, not introducing uh, the next one? Um, yeah, I'm not sure I fully understand that. I mean, so depending on the context. Um, uh, can we uh, get the fact that uh, entropy mm -hmm. So the is that in equilibrium system should uh, mm -hmm. go to the maxim maximum entropy. Yeah, I mean, so, so um, okay, I, I mean, the the statement of it, so entropy as a measure of the okay, I, I mean, I don't want to give a, the thermodynamics course now, but I, I, so so usually this comes up. In, in saying that you just want to look at um, um, an a bunch of states and then uh, you have some macroscopic variable that you're interested in such as energy or, or some distribution of energy and, um, and then we're just, we're just saying that uh, the, um, th that, that the, you, you if, if you take a, a randomly chosen state, um, you, you want to know, um, so, you know which, which choices of the macroscopic variables will have the most microstates associated with them. I, I, so, so the statement, the usual statement that you maximize entropy is just a statement that um, it's the most number of microstates um, for your given choice of um, macroscopic variables. Maybe we, we, should, we could probably talk okay. afterwards. OK. Um, OK, le let me summarize so far. So, so we have some, um, so given any quantum system with subsystems, now we can, uh, we can consider any subsystem. So actually, in general, there could be many possible choices of subsystem, any one of these spins or any collection of the spins. And then given such a subsystem, now um, we, we can uh, talk about the state of the subsystem. This is described by some density matrix. The density matrix has uh, some basic uh, invariant information about it, which includes this spectrum of eigenvalues, the entanglement spectrum. And now from that, we can quantify the uh, the entanglement of this subsystem with the rest of the system um, using uh, this von Neumann entropy. Okay, so S of S, so entanglement quantified by the I. Okay, so for example, um, we could look at a case of two spins. So here's, here's some family of states that are generally entangled with each other. But now we can quantify, um, quantify the entanglement using this en entanglement entropy. Um, so the normalization tells us that alpha squared plus beta squared equals 1. But uh, you can go ahead and, again, um, you, should, you should do this uh, in detail yourselves. Calculate the density matrix. So homework, find row for first spin and um, 
calculate S of rho. And the answer, <coughs> as a function of, of the magnitude of this first parameter, it looks like this. where this is log 2. <coughs> Actually, often in quantum information context, people will choose to define the logarithm in base 2 so that this number is just 1. Okay. So you see, as, as, you, as, you as you go continuously from just this state to just this state, the entanglement entropy peaks when those two have equal magnitude, and then it goes back down. Okay. Yes? So here, this formula applies to any density matrix at all. Okay. Um, finite temperature means that we're considering a very special form of a density matrix. Okay. Um, but this formula for the entanglement entropy, um, in that case, um, would give you the thermodynamic entropy. So if 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 you just have a system, if you have a system um, where the where, where there aren't interactions or there's very weak interactions with the surroundings and you have the probabilities given by these Boltzmann weights, then um, this formula for the entanglement entropy in that state will be the usual thermodynamic entropy that you're used to. Ah, okay, so I think you're thinking of, um, I mean, it's, okay, so we're, we're far from there yet. Um, so that, that was talking about some quantum field theory and calculate the in, calculating the entanglement entropy in quantum field theory for some subsystem of a quantum field theory. And then at fi as you increase the temperature, the, the result um, uh, starts, to get, uh, starts to look more and more like a thermodynamic entropy. But we'll, we'll see that later. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. So this is two. Um, this is two spins. So an interesting point is that. Okay. Depending on the Hamiltonian that you're considering, um, you might or might not have entanglement um, in the ground state of your system. So, so if we if we considered some spins and um, we had um, say non-interacting spins in some magnetic field, then the ground state would be not entangled at all. But for, a, for some other choice of Hamiltonian, you would have entanglement in the ground state. Okay. Um, another thing we could we we could consider would be um, oscillators instead of spins. So, so um, <clears throat> so we could consider two oscill two uncoupled oscillators. These are balls connected to springs with some spring constant, um, and then the ground state <clears throat> right would just be the ground state for the two separate oscillators. But now what I could do is consider the same system and add a spring in between. And then the ground state becomes something of the form C. So using the original basis of states, you would find that the ground state um, takes on this form. and. Uh, it's again a good homework exercise to calculate what are these coefficients here in the system, um, and you find um, you find that <coughs> in general um, this this matrix is not um, well. Okay, so so these these numbers are such that the density matrix has many different eigenvalues, and you could calculate the entanglement entropy 
um, and find that it's not zero. So as soon as you couple those two, um, as soon as, as soon as you couple the two balls together, then uh, you have some non-zero entanglement between those two subsystems in the ground state. Okay. So the next example that you you could uh, try is. to take a bunch of um, balls connected by springs. And um, in this system, yes. no. no state of this view of the whole state is pure, yes. but the state of, of the subsystem, so, so because, these, because this is some non-trivial matrix, Right? Then the, the density matrix is like C, C dash. Thank you. Okay, so this, this is a particularly interesting um, system to consider because uh, it, in, in a limit where we take many balls, um, this is a way to define uh, a simple quantum field theory. Okay, so if we take the system. <laughs> So we could uh, <coughs> imagine that the spacing uh, between these is epsilon, and we consider some subsystem of size L. Okay. So it, in, in a limit where, where you take epsilon to 0, um, this des defines some scalar field theory in 1 plus 1 dimensions. Okay. And this is actually say, the simplest example of a conformal field theory, the kinds of theories we were talking about yesterday. Okay. So, okay. Um, and one could try to um, carry out it's a, it's a relatively simple system, although uh, calculating the entanglement entropy for such a subsystem um, takes some work. I'll, I'll tell you an easier way to do it um, later on. Um, but you can, you can carry out this calculation, and you find an interesting result. Well, the most interesting thing about the result is that it's interest, I infinite. Um, 
in, in this limit where epsilon goes to zero, and we, so, so if in the language of, I'll move to the language of field theory. So if we consider um, this free scalar field theory, and we consider the entanglement entropy of an interval of length L, okay, in the limit where we take the cutoff away, then uh, you find that it diverges. Sorry. S L. Okay. Um, so you might. Yes. And then it becomes a system of decoupled harmonic oscillators, as you know. That's right. Right? The, the system of decoupled harmonic oscillators, ground state can be always written in the separable form. Now, you yeah. want to define your subsystems differently. Yes. Okay. So this is an important point, that um, the Hilbert space for this system can be written as a tensor product in many different ways. Yes. Okay. So when we define entanglement, we make a choice of which subsystem we're talking about. Okay, so here I've chosen to um, consider, say, the original um, uh, decomposition into a tensor product, um, say, before the oscillators were coupled to each other. That defines one tensor product decomposition of the Hilbert space. And then when I ask about entanglement of this subsystem, I'm talking about a particular factor in that decomposition. Okay. If I chose to study the system using normal modes, okay, um, then I have a different decomposition of the Hilbert space, uh, basically the momentum space decomposition, the Fox space decomposition. And in that case, this ground state, will, there won't be momentum space uh, entanglement. So how, yeah. Yeah. In principle, you can introduce non-zero entropy for the vacuum state depending on your attitude, how you look at it. Yeah, depend it's a different question whether you ask about this subset, it's the subsystem in position space or a subsystem in momentum space. So it's different degrees of freedom. Yeah, but what is the use of this entropy of the ground state? If you will do it like you did. Well, it's, 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 two different, it's two different questions I could ask. It's like I could ask about uh, uh, position space correlators or momentum space correlators. And there's different answers. And in some cases, you're interested in, um, in some cases, we're interested in a um, spatial correlation. So if I, if I look at this, if I look at the system, then it's an interesting, it's, it's a, it's a physical statement to say that this ball here, I'm interested in that ball, and it's correlated with that ball. Okay. This, this I would, but you see, I want to know physical question where this quantity could be useful. Where mm -hmm. you can attribute it to the ground state or to mm -hmm. the vacuum some entropy. And not entropy which is related with some kind of degeneracy. Mm -hmm. Because here, depending mm -hmm. on how you will be defining your degrees of freedom, mm -hmm. okay, you can get any answer. I normally define degree of freedom mm -hmm. for quadratic system after diagonalization. Mm -hmm. after you write Well, I mean, I, th I think, you know, when I, when I look at this particular ball here, that's, that's a physical degree of freedom that I could be interested in. You know, um, it's, it's just like correlation functions. If I, I could say, okay, this, this part of the string is correlated with this part, even though there's a normal mode decomposition. And I know that in, in the smart way of considering the system, there's a bunch of decoupled things. Um, nevertheless, I might be interested in this piece of string here and how it's related to this piece of string here. Okay. okay. So, but we'll see more examples. We'll see more examples. Yes. Well, that, yeah, that, that would be another answer that sometimes we're interested in local, local physics questions. And this is understanding the position space entanglement is, a, is asking a local question, a more local question than momentum space. Um, OK, so we were at the point of realizing that in this quantum field theory, um, 
as I take the cutoff away, <coughs> the entanglement uh, entropy is divergent. Okay. And so we might conclude that studying entanglement in the field theory context is not interesting. Um, however, it's simple to um, talk about associated quantities which are finite. Okay. So we don't have to talk about just the entanglement of, uh, of an interval in the field theory. There's various other things that we can talk about. So this is divergent. Um, but we could consider um, okay. Um, we could consider just the, the derivative of S with respect to L. How does the entanglement um, change as you, as you increase the size of the system? In this case, um, it's perfectly finite. Okay. Uh, we could consider the entanglement entropy if, if we're interested in um, considering other states, excited states above the vacuum state. Then we can consider um, the entanglement of some state. Okay. Okay. So we can consider how, how much uh, are the fields in this region entangled with the rest in some excited state uh, relative to how much they're entangled in the vacuum state. Okay, this is similar to how we might consider uh, the energy, um, energy density in a field theory and, and you know, the, there, there can be divergences, but if we subtract off the vacuum value, then you get finite quantities. Uh, another thing that's interesting to consider is um, what's called the mutual information. So if instead of one region, here I consider two different regions, okay, then I can calculate This is called mutual information. Okay, um, and so this is this is some measure of entanglement and correlations between A and B. And so just to understand this, so this, this first term measures the entanglement of A with the rest of the system. Um, the second term measures the entanglement of B with the rest of the system. And then if we subtract off the entanglement uh, of, of the combination with the rest, then roughly speaking, um, what's left would be uh, something like the entanglement between A and B. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. So, the, so all of these, the point of this is that all of these are actually finite quantities. And uh, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, whether it's positive, and it turns out that um, it's, it's an easy exercise to show that it's always positive. Um, so this is always positive. And that follows from a property of entanglement entropies called uh, sub-additivity. Um, and that's, that's, that's true of any, in any quantum system. If you have um, a density matrix for, so you, you could start with a density matrix um, for, for two subsystems together, and then you can calculate from that the density matrix for A and the density matrix for B, and you can show that the von Neumann entropies satisfy um, uh, an inequality, which is that this is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so that's actually a good, also a good homework exercise to try to show that um, it's it's not too hard. Okay, and it's saturated. This is minus. 
There is a quantity when you take correlation of entropy, which is conserved. Okay, normal entropy grows, the correlation of entropy grows, but in time, okay, the whole entropy is conserved. So this is the entropy of different This, yeah, I, I don't know any dynamical statement about this that, that ah, okay. suggests. Well, because yeah. correlation of entropy was introduced, mm -hmm. and you can define entropy as conserved quantity, mm -hmm. just second law of thermodynamics tells that one part is growing, the other is decreasing, Okay, all of it, like this one, okay, mm -hmm. some S, A, A, B. Mm -hmm. It's growing, but correlation entropy is negative, and the whole thing is conserved. It I should see. be never mm. a PhD, for example. Okay, y yeah, that may be a different Yeah. No, no, it's concept. very similar it's the same. what he was doing it actually in statistical physics, but you can recalculate it. I see. This, uh, the, the okay. Um, that's, yeah, so actually sort of related to that just dynamical discussion, um, it's an interesting thing to point out that um, any of these quantities, entanglement entropies um, or mutual informations, um, they can be calculated for arbitrary time-dependent states. Okay, so sometimes when we think about entropy, we uh, are always talking about some equilibrium state. Um, but you should, this, this notion doesn't apply to entanglement entropies. You could take any state. It could be time dependent. And at any given time, you can calculate the entanglement entropy. And you could calculate it for a later time for the same subsystem. It could change. Okay. Uh, yeah, question. The, so here, here I'm assuming that. Um, Let's see, am I assuming that what I had in mind here was that A and B are, are disjoint subsystems? Um, let's see, so probably, um, so if I said S of A union C plus S of B union C minus S of A. Um, let's see, if they were the same, I, th I think it would be okay. Yeah. I th yeah. <coughs> okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm not, sh I, th I think you could actually use this definition even if, if they intersected. Yeah, there's another, there's another one. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about strong subadditivity. Y yes, you, you, you could. Let's, let's get back to that. But yeah, that's right. right this, this follows from this more general condition on, on entanglement entropies called strong subadditivity, but I'll put off talking about that for a little while. The equality applies when they are the same system? Ah, the, no, the equality applies when rho AB is rho A tensor rho B. Okay. If and only if. Okay, so good. So even though, um, even though this itself is divergent, there's a bunch of interesting things that you can calculate um, that are actually finite and that survive the limit when epsilon goes to zero. So it is an interesting uh, quantity to calculate uh, even in the quantum field theory limit. Okay. Now, this, this result, um, it turns out, <coughs> this behavior that S is proportional to the log of the size of the system, turns out to be um, a universal result for any conformal field theory in two dimensions. And I will be telling you how, how one can later, how one can actually do this calculation for a general conformal field theory. Okay. So the only difference is that, okay, instead of, uh, instead of one there, then you get this parameter that I mentioned yesterday, which is the central charge of the CFT.
So this is true for any 2D CFT. Okay. Okay, so now I want to start connecting back with um, this idea um, that some of these theories might have um, an associated dual gravitational theory, okay? But I'll start not by assuming that, but just by making an observation about this result, okay? I'll make the observation that it was made. But could you tell in conformal field theory what you yeah. take as a basis to get this entropy for the ground state? Well, I'm taking a... I'm, I'm, I'm calculating... I mean, it's still it's a position space basis. So you're in position space? I'm still ta yeah, so we're still talking about position space, and we're looking at the basis, you know, the field basis of in position space. Yeah. So it's like field operators, okay, which you take, because the next that, uh, I mean, your state is like the state of this guy. Yes, yeah. So I'll talk about uh, how to calculate it using path integral, and, and, and there, you know, it's just, Specifically, the, the field, the position space field basis that we're using. <coughs> okay, so the interesting observation okay, which perhaps you wouldn't have noticed um, without some previous literature on ADS-CFT, but in hindsight, we can just notice it. Um, the interesting observation is that S can be represented uh, geometrically using some auxiliary anti de Sitter space that we introduce. Okay? And so, The picture is that we want to consider okay, the same anti de Sitter space that we looked at. looked at yesterday. So this is in the Poincaré coordinates, where we have z equals 0 being the boundary of anti de Sitter space. Okay. And now, um, OK, so we think about um, some identification between this, this uh, lot. This, well, there's a Minkowski space at the boundary okay, with the space that our conformal field theory lives on. Okay. And so I'm gonna, I can ask a geometrical question about this anti de Sitter space that gives exactly the same answer as this question about the entanglements in the conformal field theory. Okay. And the geometrical question is to consider an interval on the boundary of length L and ask what is the length of the shortest path through anti de Sitter space whose endpoints are the same as the endpoints of this interval. Okay. And because of the geometry of anti de Sitter space, um, the path is not just out at the boundary. Okay. It extends into the middle of the space, okay, um, this is a very useful homework. If you just do one homework exercise, this is probably the one to do um, to start with, start with this ADS and um, take, <coughs> okay, the, the functional, which is the, the length of a curve, and extremize that functional subject to the constraints that the two endpoints are at the endpoints of this interval, and then find the length. Okay. Well, the answer you get perfectly matches this one because it's infinity. Um, but uh, you can also do the following thing. Um, so instead of, instead of just settling for infinity, um, you can consider... Uh, a geometrical cutoff at z equals epsilon, okay, the same epsilon is over here, and then instead of calculating the length, the full length, just calculate the length outside this cutoff region, okay. Okay.
Okay. So for the CFT, we had s equals c over 3 uh, log over epsilon. And for the geometry side, then the answer turns out to be s equals uh, 2 LADS times log L over epsilon. Okay. Okay. So, so um, apart from this, these overall coefficients, um, you have you have this nice, you have this nice equivalence. Now, Ryu and Takenagi, who who noticed this. We're, we're thinking about it in the context of, um, of ADS CFT. Okay, so in that context, it's not just that there's some auxiliary geometry that happens to have these properties. Um, there, there's the belief that for certain CFTs, you actually have uh, a dual gravitational theory, and the vacuum state of the CFT would correspond to um, some physical state in this gravitational theory where the associated space-time geometry is ADS. Okay. Um, now, if you remember, um, in that context, we had so in the gravity theory, there's actually another there's a scale which is uh, the Planck scale. Okay. So we had this other scale, and then we had a connection between that. The ratio LADS over L Planck, we had a connection that said that this ratio, which should be large if we want to have a classical limit of the gravity theory, um, that was associated with the central charge of the conformal field theory. Okay. And the power here in the two-dimensional case is just one. Now, actually, one can, one can do calculations such as comparing the entropy, um, this is the thermodynamic entropy at high temperature, to establish uh, exactly what the coefficient here would be. Okay, so, so you have, um, in this context of holography, some particular relation between the central charge and this, this ADS length. Okay, well, then it turns out you get a very fascinating result when you when you write down exactly how these two or sorry this is length <clears throat> you get a fascinating result when you write down exactly how these two things are related okay and the result is so s so actually uh, it's useful instead of instead of saying length here um, I'm going to say area because this in a in a two-dimensional context, um, this would be a co-dimension one surface of space-time. And so it would be appropriate to, to call it an area in the general A sense of, of area, meaning the volume of some co-dimension one surface. Okay? So you get a relation that turns out to be um, S is equal to this area um, over, well, so 6L ADS over C, so just, just using these, these two formulas. But then now um, I'll use this relation, area, and you get for L Planck, or, okay, so in, in two dimensions, um, the, the Planck, well, the Newton constant is, has dimensions of length, and it's just the Planck scale, okay. Um, okay, so this is, Familiar to. Well, this is one dimensional integral. Of course, you can call it area, but nevertheless, it's length. It's it's length, and it's it's in in general dimensions. Uh, we'll see the generalization to this, and what we'll be looking at are co-dimension one surfaces. Yeah, well, this is okay. So, for instance, when you take the curve, so yeah. what is the dimension of your boundary? It's three or four. This, so you wrote the this spatial, this is the spatial, uh, you're right, it's just a length, it's just a length. Yes, this is the spatial uh, geometry. What kind of ideas do you consider? How many ADS3, ADS3. ADS3, three. ADS three, yeah. So, okay, good. So, yeah. for ADS4, it will be... For ADS4, ADS four, it's going to be an area. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And you will be extremely... 
bubble. Yes. Yeah, that's right. We'll get, we'll get to it. OK. OK, so of course, um, of course this is uh, very familiar, especially to some, uh, someone in the second row. Um, <coughs> um, so this, uh, this particular formula, um, we, we understood as some, um, well, I should say Jacob understood as some, uh, some connection between the geometrical properties of black holes and some thermodynamic properties. Okay, so, so it was realized that, um, that black holes obey certain laws uh, analogous to the laws of thermodynamics. And uh, the entropy being equal to area over 4 G Newton makes these laws um, work out exactly much later in the ADS CFT context, well, a little bit later um, than it was understood that there's really some thermodynamics lurking behind those uh, laws of black hole physics. And in the ADS CFT context, um, the way that we would interpret this formula is that the, say, the area of a black hole in ADS, okay, would actually be um, interpreted as um, a statistical mechanical entropy, and it's the entropy of the dual CFT state. Okay. Okay. So in that context, now we're, we're seeing um, a different manifestation of this formula. Okay. It's not talking about the entropy of a CFT, of the entire CFT. Um, so, so we would say the entropy of the entire CFT um, is related to the area of this black hole horizon. Now we're talking about the vacuum state of the CFT. And we're looking at, well, okay, we're looking at <coughs> what I'm saying actually, if we, could, we could do this for, for a, a CFT on a circle as well, or, or, a, or a line, uh, everything works out. Um, but what we're saying is that the entanglement the entropy of some interval on the CFT um, is described exactly by this formula if we interpret the area as being the area of this extremal surface in the associated anti de Sitter space. Yes? Is there some. Well, I mean, you can, hmm. uh, so you, you can just do a CFT calculation and get the answer, and then you notice that it happens to be, um, happens to be um, reproduced by this geometrical quantity. Um, why, I mean, why questions are always hard, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I think I would say that it's still an open question, it's, and a very interesting question to understand um, well, why the, why the entanglement structure um, in these particular CFT uh, ground states is reproducible by some geometrical structure. Okay? I, I, I should say more. I should say more because there's going to be a much stronger statement soon. Okay? So far, the statement is um, we just talked about 2D CFTs. Uh, let me, let me uh, talk about the generalization to higher dimensions. Okay, so this... <clears throat> it turns out that we can, we can consider some, uh, some uh, general higher dimensional conformal field theory. For the ease of drawing things, I'll draw uh, a two-dimensional one. So this is, this is space. Um, and in that case, well, actually, we can consider lots of different shapes of regions. Um, but in general, it's difficult to calculate entanglement entropy. However, for a ball-shaped region, OK, so we start in the vacuum state of the CFT, and we look at a ball-shaped region of space. Then I can calculate the entanglement entropy in the conformal field theory. OK, and I'll be, again, I'll be telling you how to do that probably next time. Um, and one can consider then the associated uh, higher dimensional ADS space. So if this is CFT um, D, this would be ADS D plus 1. 
And one can compute, again, the, uh, the extremal surface whose boundary is the boundary of this ball. Okay. If you use these coordinates, so in general, um, in general using these coordinates uh, is nice for this calculation because the answer turns out to be just um, a hemisphere. The answer turns out to be um, x squared plus z squared equals this r squared. Okay, so it's it's not trivial to uh, so one one should go ahead and extremize the action, but but if sometimes if you know the answer, it's easier to to find to, to check that that's the right solution. Um, and then one can do the same calculation, and again um, you find that well first that that everything is divergent. Um, it's interesting that in this higher dimensional case, um, the divergence is proportional uh, now to the area okay, of the boundary of this region. Okay, so this is, a different, this, is, this is a different sense of area, area of the boundary of this. Um, Okay, but again, if you if you place a cutoff surface, um, then you find agreement between the two results. <coughs> yes. No. What? So so, I was careful to uh, I was careful to write down the precise coefficient relating. This ratio um, of the ADS and plane. So, so in holographic theories, we have we have a, a precise relation that can be established using other calculations. Okay, and using that precise relation, um, you find that um, combining these two formulas gives exactly this with exactly one over four g newton. Right, this, this I get to choose depending on what my conformal field theory is. Um, and, then, uh, and then this would be a result of some other computation. <coughs> okay. Related to the fact that when one computes the entanglement of any ball to the outside universe, you get an entanglement entropy, which is the, due to the renormalization of G, so you get the one fourth the quantity. There, but you can reabsorb this infinity in saying I renormalize G and then I get the Bekenstein working thing. But yeah, no, I th so I think this is a different statement. statement. So there's an, there's an older story about trying to understand um, black hole entropy as entanglement entropy. And. And you get the renormalization of G. Yeah, there, right. There, there's, there's some, yeah. The, so this is, a, this is somewhat of a different story. I'm going to connect back to that eventually. Um, but here, here, one thing I'll point out is that the only div when I talk about divergences in this situation, um, the only divergences have to do with, um, so this is really a classical calculation in, the, in this gravity side uh, so far. And the only divergences that we're talking about have to do with the fact that it's an infinite distance out to the boundary of ADS. Um, there aren't any divergences yet um, related to just the, um, the bulk story. Okay. Okay. And also, by the way, you assume relation for L ADS with center of jet. So, so this, re yeah, this relation where uh, I'm, I'm doing some other calculation to establish. So, okay. for example, calculating. Um, the entropy in the CFT at high temperatures and, and calculating the same thing on the gravity side and then I, I, I find this. Okay, so I, I can do uh, other, I can calculate other physical things to establish this relation. But um, uh, you made the full statement that your correspondence now for the area goes only for the ground state of the power. Yeah, okay, so let's, let's, let's move on. And this thing to third C you establish when you have the theorem in 
idea. So you know, well, but, but this is a relation between parameters of the yes, theory. Okay. okay. This is just a relation between parameters. Uh, but right now, what you prove, you prove in fact, actually, that the number of states is proportional to the area, but just for so-called ground states somehow, without exciting. Yeah. Let, so I'm, I'm about to talk about now um, yes, generalizing this. Was doing similar thing for the systems on quantum optics, as perhaps you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, also calculating the entropy for the ground state and then doing actually the things on the boundary. Okay, but for okay. ground state, he found some kind of holography on the boundary. Mm -hmm. But for mm -hmm. next excited state, it doesn't go. Yeah. So, so let you yeah. <coughs> so, so that's a, that's an important point. So, so let let me say what we've what we've claimed so far. Uh, so, so apart apart from this, um, this this proportionality. Um, this is true for any CFT, okay? The, the functional form of this as a, as a function of L and the higher dimensional version here for ball-shaped regions. Um, this is something that you can calculate for any CFT and it's universal. Um, and so the fact that some auxiliary geometry happens to um, reproduce the entanglements, it's not specific to holographic CFTs, okay? Um, but now, um, if if we go beyond the vacuum state, or we go beyond round regions, ball-shaped regions, if, if I consider some general region, okay, then so far we have no reason to assume that there's any, that this geometry has any relevance to such entanglements, okay. However, um, we can make a conjecture, so Ryu and Takenagi made a conjecture that this formula um, goes beyond what we what we have observed so far, <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, so I mean, based based on these these fairly simple observations, okay, and I guess a belief in the fundamental significance of this formula, um, Ryu and Takenagi conjectured that for certain CFTs, okay, so not every CFT, but for these special ones that might have a gravity dual theory, so I'll call them holographic <coughs> CFTs. Um, the relation S equals area over 4G Newton holds for any region A. Um, and any state psi um, with a, I'll, I'll, call, I'll say a classical gravity dual, classical um, dual space time. Okay, actually I can't remember specifically if their conjecture was this strong in the original paper, but I'll state this as, as a conjecture. And so let me just, um, just to be clear, so now what we're saying is consider one of these special CFTs. Okay, so the, the conjecture is that there exists some special CFTs where if I now take um, any one of, um, uh, of, say, some family of states where I can associate a dual geometry and consider any region, A, any subsystem, okay, well now the dual geometry is supposed to be asymptotically ADS with the same boundary geometry, okay, so I can consider um, uh, a similar region on the boundary of my ADS space. <clears throat> I can compute the extremal area surface that ends on that you know, which, which has the same boundary as A, so A tilde has the same boundary of A, 
Um, and so this is in the space-time, whatever space-time uh, is dual du psi. So if it's not the vacuum, it won't be pure ADS. It would be some asymptotically ADS space-time. Um, and then the conjecture is that, uh, again, that SA is equal to the area of A tilde over 4G Newton. Okay, so the conjecture is that for these special CFTs, the structure of entanglement um, in not just the vacuum state, but even more general states um, is such that it can be re reproduced in the, by these geometrical calculations. But holographic CFT is also still conjecture. You should forget about it, right? In spite of the words, it will be well, believed. Yeah, I mean, the c y you could make this as a particular kind of holography conjecture. So independent of the whole ADS-CFT dis discussion, um, we could actually make the conjecture that just that a, a minimal conjecture would be that there exist CFTs that have this property. Okay. okay. So what is conjecture about conjecture CFT? Correct? No, the conjecture, is, the conjecture would be the existence of such CFTs. Yes, okay. it's conjecture. And then if I will believe no, there's only that one. it's conjecture that this CFT is uh, equivalent in the sense of entropy to for all states for any region. Right. So the, what the conjecture would be that if you, fa if, 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 if you had such a CFT, then you could compute the entanglement entropy in this way. Okay. I mean, I can, I can use the, previ like the other ADS-CFT conjecture. I could tell you then some particular CFTs where I think this would be true. But, yeah. Yes? Yeah, okay. Good. Yeah, let me, okay, let, let me make various comments about this. Okay. Um, let me, there's, there's a bunch of things I should say um, to finish. <clears throat> okay. All right. So, so one comment is that if this is true, this gives us a way, um, plausibly, to reconstruct geometry based on entanglement. Okay, so, so supposing I didn't know the geometry, okay, if, say this is true, but I don't know the geometry, um, I could start with my state, I could calculate um, SA for many A, and so I, I calculate the entanglement at a brief for all sorts of regions. And then I ask, um, is there some geometry that reproduces all of those calculations? And find m psi such that the area of A tilde equals SA. Okay. Now, there are, there's way more information. If I think about how many different regions there are, um, I can draw any possible shape. There's way more information there in that entanglement calculation than there is in the metric for some, <coughs> for some dual geometry. Okay. So, um, so this is uh, you know, a highly, highly over-constrained problem. Um, and so you know, it, it's, it's a miracle if, if you could find any geometry. But the, you know, according to the conjecture, you would find some geometry where this is true. And that means that you would have just um, reconstructed, based on the entanglement structure of your state, you would have reconstructed some dual geometry. Um, and that would, so, so conjecture, OK, great, would be that in ADS-CFT, this would be a way, this would be a, a, a crucial element in the dictionary where you start um, not by computing some kind of ordinary field theory observables like correlation functions, but now we're actually looking at entanglements um, and, you're, and you're calculating geometries. Um, so getting back to your question, um, this particular formula, okay, so I should say that um, in, even in the black hole context, this particular formula is understood as something that applies in the case of Einstein gravity in the classical limit, okay? And so it's understood to have 
um, corrections. So there's a generalization by Wald and others. Um, given any kind of classical gravitational Lagrangian, um, there's some there's something that replaces area such that um, such that uh, black hole laws still work. Um, so th there there are now um, I mean the conjecture would be um, actually it's not quite the Wald formula here replacing area. Um, there's there's something there's something like the Wald formula plus some correction terms that that will vanish in in situations where you would just apply this to a black hole. But um, so in general, this could be if if your gravity theory is not just Einstein gravity, uh, this is understood to be modified. But there's a particular proposal for that um, at the quantum level. That's just alpha prime corrections, right? At the quantum level, um, again, there's also some understanding in the black hole literature and recently in this context of, uh, of what the first correction to this formula is. Okay, and the, the, so the statement is um, <coughs> that, and this is by uh, Faulkner and Maldacena, and actually was there someone else on that? Lukovitz, yeah, okay. Um, so this, this is that um, G. Newton plus, um, <coughs> okay, so, so roughly speaking, the, the correction is that um, if you consider the entanglement entropy but look at the 1 over n corrections in the field theory, um, then those 1 over n corrections correspond to bulk entanglement entropy um, between the bulk fields inside this surface, this extremal surface, and outside the extremal surface. Okay, so that would be, that's the, the understanding of how this uh, extends to 1 over n. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, this is, yeah, this is actually a pretty good place to stop. Um, I'll just mention that, so in addition, I mean, what is the evidence for this? Um, in addition to the fact that it works for, you know, for, for the few cases that we can calculate, um, there are a bunch of general properties. I mentioned subadditivity. There's also this strong subadditivity property that we'll get to in the future. There are a bunch of general properties that have to be satisfied by entanglement entropies. And one can check whether this formula um, uh, calculating entanglements based on this formula satisfies these properties for, for geometries. Um, and so uh, there, there are various checks like this that have been passed by this formula. Um, recently, there's been uh, um, a proof, I suppose, um, by um, Lukovitz and Maldacena um, of this formula, in, uh, at least in certain situations. And I may, I may have time to, to go through that. Um, next time. Okay. Uh, so I'll stop there for today. Questions? I suspect that if you just took any, um, okay, so I, I suspect it would not be hard to show that for, say, a free field theory, um, this would fail. Um, there, are, there are cases, yeah, there, so there are, okay, so um, let me mention one particular result of, um, Yeah. I mean, so, so let me refer to one particular result of um, Hayden, Hedrick, and Maloney, where uh, so they they showed that. Um, okay. There's there's something some combination of uh, entanglement entropies that you can write down. S of C. Um, plus S of, oh, minus S of ABC. Okay, so considering three regions, okay, 
there's some combination of entanglement entropies. It's just it's like a souped up version of this mutual information, um, where in general in quantum field theories this combination of things could either be positive or negative or zero. And what they showed was that um, using this formula and applying it to some geometry, you would always get, uh, I can't remember if it was a positive or a negative quantity, probably a, a positive quantity. Okay? And so what that tells you is that if you just consider any of these theories that give you a negative quantity for that, there's no way that you could have a geometry that would um, that would reproduce the answers for the entanglement entropies in that theory. Okay. But yeah, I mean, I think the, the statement that you can reproduce this means that the entanglement entropy is, is extremely highly constrained. So I mentioned that, um, so, so if I wanted to look at a set of information, of entanglement entropy information that was about the same amount of information as the, the metric of the dual space, um, what I could do would be to look at the entanglement entropy of ball-shaped regions of various sizes. Okay. So those would be labeled by the coordinates of the center of the ball and by the radius of the ball, okay. which, is, which is roughly like um, the set of things that, you know, roughly the set of labels for the, the points in the dual space. Okay. So if I calculated the entanglement entropies for just those ball-shaped regions at all the different points, um, then using about that amount of information, I should be able to reconstruct a dual geometry, okay? But then from that dual geometry, I would be able to calculate the extremal surfaces for any other region, okay? And therefore, the entanglement entropies for, the, for any other region. And so, to understand these constraints, we could say that roughly speaking, um, the CFTs, or the states for which this is true, would have the property that once I know the entanglement just for ball-shaped regions, um, that actually determines all of the other entanglement entropies. Okay. And that's, that's a, 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 an extremely kind of constrained state. Okay. So it's, it's somewhat of a miracle um, that or if such states would exist. Yeah, I mean, that, um, what one could, in principle, come up with a formula like that. Um, I think I'm not sure if it, it might be it might be unbearably messy, but it, it, it's an, actually an interesting something that that I'd like to try. But yeah. Okay, let's thank Mark for the beautiful.